uh, again, everyone, welcome to this panel. So the title of this panel is Translators as Literary Mediators. Um, and the topic of this panel is the importance of the mediating role of translators in different cult countries and within different cultural environments. So what we're going to talk about is the focus of different cultural environments and uh, what defines them and the role of literary translators in them. Uh, so our participants today, uh, Ruth Ametai Kemp, uh, Lawrence Schimmel and Simona Skrabitz come from different countries and they work as literary mediators in different environments as well. So uh, I'm going to do a very short presentation and after that we're going to start the panel. Uh, so Ruth Ametai Kemp is a literary translator working from Arabic, German and Russian into English. She translates fiction and nonfiction and has a particular interest in history, historical fiction, and writing for children and young adults. Her translations include books from Germany, Jordan, Morocco, Palestine, Russia, Switzerland, and Syria. So uh, welcome, Ruth. Um, <laughs> our uh, next guest is Lawrence Schimmel, who is a bilingual author <laughs> writing in both Spanish and English who has published over 120 books in a wide range of genres. Um, his writing has been translated into over 40 languages and he himself is a prolific translator into both English and Spanish and has translated over 130 books of fiction, poetry, essays, graphic novels and works for children. So, works for children. so uh, hello, Lawrence. Um, and our uh, final uh, and our uh, last guest is Simona Skravets, who is uh, a translator, essayist, and a literary critic. Uh, the main focus of her work is on translation from Slovene to Catalan and Spanish, and from Catalan to Slovene. Uh, she has introduced several modern Slovenian authors to the Spanish and Catalan readers, and has been establishing connections between these cultures for over thirty years, and has also received some awards as a for her work as a translator. So, uh, hello, Simona. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to uh, ask my first question and perhaps we can start with you, Ruth. Um, how would you in short present your role as a literary mediator within your environment? Uh, what exactly do you do? Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm a pretty much full-time um, translator, um, but I do a few things on the side. Um, I translate um, adult books and children from um, three languages. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, I work from Arabic, German and Russian, as you said. Um, most of my work is non-fiction, um, but increasingly I'm doing more children's books, and that's the area where I suppose I'm most energetic. So besides I'm lucky a lot of the work comes to me. I get an email from um, publishers asking, would you like to translate this book? Because they've heard by word of mouth that that's something I'm interested in. But um, I'm more and more spending time um, advocating for um, books from countries where I would like to see more books translated. Um, uh, at the moment, I've been um, trying to advocate more for books from Ukraine, for example, um, but particularly across the Arab world, um, we don't see many books being translated from Arabic. Um, and so together with other colleagues who World Kid Lit, the community project, which Lawrence Schimmel started, um, together with two other um, translators and literary activists. Um, so in that community, and then also in another community of Arabic translators called Arab Kid Lit Now, um, we're um, always looking for ways to um, champion books written in Arabic, for example, um, which we think would work well in English and um, show them to publishers, translate samples, um, write about them on, on the various blogs that I contribute to. Um, so in various ways, I'm trying to um, connect people, connect publishers, agents, translators, um, and make the most of this growing community um, that we've got um, together um, uh, celebrating World Kidlet whether it's on social media, by email or, or whatever. So we'll talk more about those various ways that we, we connect and use that community, but that's, that's it in short, thank you. Yeah, that's great. So uh, you, you mentioned that you work in, you have more than one role to say. 
Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, Lawrence, would you also describe your experience as such? Sure, I also am wearing many hats. Um, you know, not only am I creating and translating in multiple directions the same way that Simona is. I mean, we're you doing fewer uh, languages, uh, Simona and I, than Ruth is, where Ruth is translating um, from more very different languages. And, you know, she's also working on um, something that she had been working on for a while. With the various roles, with the various languages, I think is a reader. That's how I think of myself. I read voraciously. I read all across the board. I write across the board, but um, you know, I read lots of things and I find lots of books that I want to share with lots of people. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of times where I get commissioned to do translations. There's a lot of times that I find books um, that I just fall in love with and say, uh, you know, go knocking on doors to, to publishers until I find someone who's, who's interested in them. There are, um, lots of um, inequalities in the world and they're reflected in the publishing world as well. And so there's a lot of, um, I have a personal commitment that I make sure that I translate at least one writer of color every year in any direction, just because these are voices that are not otherwise being uh, focused on. Um, I try and translate a lot of um, LGBT writers. I particularly translate, um, so I also, I run a small poetry publisher and one of the things we started in 2014 was an imprint called Periscope, where we publish uh, translations of poets, women poets who have published at least two books in their own country. So they're not a one book wonder, um, but they haven't yet been published in English. And so um, we've been actively trying, this was something I started when um, the there was number crunching that had been done and it was posted on, uh, I think we were to that borders saying that Everything translated into English in the US, fiction, poetry, and nonfiction from all languages, all genres, only 26% were by women writers. So there's a lack of women's voices that are not being translated. And I, I certainly experienced this as a translator, um, especially from the Spanish um, into English. The government support um, from the countries that do offer government support is very often very misogynistic. And so um, some countries, you know, Argentina is very egalitarian. It doesn't matter if you're Cortaza or a 16 year old girl in Ushuaia, they will support any Argentine writer, but other countries tend to be, um, just to call out Mexico, I didn't do the most recent one. They, they haven't been funding their, their program for a while, but the penultimate funding program, only nine out of the 60 grants for relations in Mexican works all of them were for women writers. I mean, there's an extra, and so, you know, I feel that part of my things that I do is I can redress that by turning the writers uh, in this. Oh, sorry, I lost you. I think we lost you for a bit towards the end. I think you were saying uh, something about uh, opportunity. <laughs> If you could just repeat the last well, I don't know where you lost me, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so. Um, um, that because, we are... how far back was it that I got lost, just so that I know? <laughs> <laughs> um, it was Just a, a very little bit. A lot of sentence. Okay. Um, basically, I feel that, you know, as someone who has certain amount of privilege, uh, that it's a duty for me to try and use the privilege I had to open doors to help other voices. Um, and also as a reader to be able to share other voices with more people, uh, so. Yeah, wow, that's uh, very, very, uh, very nicely put. Um, Simona, would you um, also, so uh, do you think, do you also feel this responsibility uh, when it comes to choosing uh, authors or for translations, how would you define your your uh, role within your environment? So you work in uh, Cat Catalonia, right? Oh, it depends. <laughs> uh, I, I think that we both, the three of us are really a special club. Uh, <laughs> we could fund something, uh, an association or something like that, because really it's not common to see people like Lawrence and Ruth. I'm very pleased to meet you. I know Lawrence personally, but it, it's long ago. And Ruth, I'm very pleased to meet you today here. Uh, so my, uh, my um, 
what I do, I actually don't know, and I like very much uh, Lawrence's definition of himself, uh, that he is a reader. I, I believe that is actually my only role. I would really say, what do you like to do? It's to read and be there. Uh, so I started, um, uh, actually, I always wanted to, uh, to write about literature, not to translate. It was um, to know languages, but to know them, not because I ever thought that I would be a translator. So that is still my my first uh, motivation to do my anything is that I like the book or that I think that there is something that must be shared or explained or interpreted. So it's not really that I feel myself like a mediator in the first uh, place, but maybe more like an interpret somebody who knows things and want to share them and open the debate. Uh, so my life is somehow divided between my Slovene origins and my life in Catalonia, in Barcelona. Uh, you, Lawrence knows <laughs> well enough how difficult the life in Barcelona itself is. You know, so the cultural life, it's divided between Catalan and Spanish and we, we are all the time in this tension. Uh, and so that I try to be like playing all these grounds not to forget where I come from. So that is why I'm always trying to translate from here into Slovenian. And I, before explained, I only do uh, Catalan authors because I think that Spanish authors, they have enough other translators who know Spanish and can translate them into Slovenian. So they don't need me for that. But mm -hmm. it is possible that I will tr start translating things, especially more from South America, where is, as Lauren said, the, the opportunities are not so uh, evident as for the Spanish authors. Then I translate also uh, in the other direction, uh, and not only from Slovenian into uh, into Catalan and Spanish, but also from Serbo-Croatian. Let's say the whole the whole thing, no? Um, because I feel this responsibility that we need to share this experience, especially because of, uh, because of the wars in the nineties that we try to bring um, uh, writers, uh, poets, uh, uh, testimonies from that places uh, to Spain, uh, which uh, uh, is not very easy to do that because this is not a country that would be very open to conflict situation mm -hmm. or to histo historic memory or things like that. So it's always quite difficult. Uh, and also I would, I of course do my own writings, not, not, not only about books, but I, as you know, I started to write also uh, literary books. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm still teaching quite a lot and maybe even, even more and more. So I try to build an academic career here in Spain, which is also some kind of very difficult <laughs> idea. I don't know if I will be able to uh, to do it or not but it, I'm still here and and I also uh, write about Catalan authors in press here in Barcelona so maybe what helps me to promote an author uh, from unknown uh, countries languages like Slovenia or Croatia or Bosnia is also the, the fact that I somehow am starting to be uh, somebody in Catalan letters you know, so I can actually say this is a good author. Some publishers will maybe now believe uh, 10 or 20 years ago, it was much more difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that, um, you said that Barcelona is a difficult city to live in? <laughs> well, it is not diff. it's interesting, but it's not easy, you know, if you are right. living in the middle of Paris, you would not have this this question in which language should I write or what should I translate, but uh, Barcelona has this uh, double uh, uh, bilingual structure and you have to move around it like we mm -hmm. live. So this is one of the challenges that you are dealing with as a literary mediator. Um, perhaps, Ruth, could you um, share some of the um, challenges that are unique to your environment, to the environment in which you work and translate? Um, yeah, I also just wanted to say that I suppose in a way my career began in Barcelona because when I was 19, I, I trained as an English teacher on a month-long course 
in Barcelona. So I suppose I started my career as a teacher and and then simultaneously as a translator. And I've always seen them as quite interconnected. There's times in my life where I'm more of a translator and there were times when I was more of a teacher. I also wanted to ask Simona, what do you teach when you're teaching at university? Is it more literature or more translation? Well, the, the, here comes another language I teach uh, huh? now. Uh, I, my, my first studies were in German uh, language, so I'm teaching now translation from German uh, to Catalan and Spanish uh, at the Faculty for Translation and uh, on other universities I teach liter literature, yes, theory. <laughs> wow, Simona, you sound busy too. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Um, we yeah, we so jumped ahead from Catalina's question, but I did also want to ask Simona something or to mention that um, one of the things I think that Simona's done that we haven't talked about yet is um, editing an anthology of Slovin literature that she also translated into Spanish, which was a very important project, I think, for introducing um, Slovin literature and Slovin writers, sort of, you know, something that now. Uh, for instance, Spain, now that this year Spain is the guest country at the, the Frankfurt Book Fair, is creating and translating into English samplers of things. But, you know, Simona had done this as a literary project many, many years ago before, um, I mean, uh, Slovenia is going to be the guest of honor next year. So hopefully that project, you know, will, will get an extra life or, or extra attention, um, you know, especially on the, the handoff between, um, you know, it's a good moment for, there's this extra funding from uh, Slovenia for writers who, for publishers who want to translate Slovenian authors. So it's a good time for publishers in Spain to go back and look at that book and say, ah, maybe we could do a book by, you know, one of these authors. And so I think as a, as a literary mediator or as a tool for discovery, that sort of project is invaluable, you know, and especially, you know, Simona, as someone who's in, integrally in and from the two cultures that she's working between, you know, she didn't just translate an existing Slovene anthology, but put together her own uh, selection. So if I don't assume if you can talk about that project jumping in, but you know, that was something you didn't mention in your introduction that I think is such an important and valuable. Yes, maybe Ruth was now speaking about herself, Sorry. but <laughs> but later I will I will speak a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you, Lorraine. Um, yes, to go, uh, you asked about the challenges yes. uh, for the languages or the, um, the countries that I work with. <laughs> um, and I'd say it is really um, different for each of the languages I work from. And the challenges experienced, not just for me, but for the community of translators I'm part of, um, it's a very different experience for each of those three languages. Um, personally, um, one of the main challenges is maintaining three languages at this high level and sadly it's often my Arabic that suffers um, which is frustrating because I feel like if I have any spare energy to, to mediate or be an activist or champion literature it's Arabic that needs it more than anything <laughs> um, and, and really that's one reason among many that I, I specialize in children's books because I'm able to read more and able to read more comfortably um, and the flip side to the, well, speaking about Arabic a bit more, the, the biggest challenge I would say in, um, in translating and sort of importing Arabic literature into English is the lack of agents and um, how little is known among publishers of the community of translators and the community of, of readers and experts. Um, and I think a lot of publishers are keen in principle to, to explore an Arabic author or read a, take on a book in translation. But if they only know one translator, that's only one opinion that they will hear. And really they need to be receiving book reports from a number of agents, a number of translators, um, and to have a, a community that they can rely on to, to go to them for um, a second opinion, a third opinion, and so on. Um, and I think that's the stage that I'm at with Arabic um, personally and, and after the community is um, trying to get out of this bottleneck where until now it would be individual translators writing to a publisher, pitching a book, but doing that on their own. And then the publisher might think, yeah, great, but now what do they do with it? I still don't know if it's a good enough book. And so now we're trying to be more organized, support each other, help each other with pitching, uh, recommend each other as readers, and, and create 
not just a community, but also an impression of a community that publishers can go to um, um, for sort of expert advice. Um, um, and that's both in the, the adult literary world, but also um, for me, especially for children's books. Um, in, with my other languages, that issue, the issues are not the same because for German, there's a lot of agents working um, who are in, uh, in contact with English language publishers um, and do very well to represent their books. Um, and that's one reason I have a lot of work that comes to me um, you know, without me looking for it, particularly, um, and recommended for books that a publisher has heard about at Bologna or at Frankfurt Books there, um, either from an agent or from the foreign rights set. And actually in Germany, it's more common that it's the in-house foreign rights set who is selling the, the rights rather than a, a separate literary agent. But that's, um, and also there's very good funding. And I think we'll talk about that more. That often is, is the crux of it. And then Russian is somewhere in between. There's, there's agents and there's a really wonderful um, new agent representing Russian children's books. It was just getting established. And now, of course, with this awful war, that's on hold. Um, and, and there was funding for Russian literature. Of course, no one can go near that. And that, that's, you know, everything there is on hold, which is, is one, well, and of course, um, is one reason why I've been particularly keen to um, work on Ukrainian, but it was my own Ukrainian as you know, as a, a linguist, I've been learning it for a couple of years and collaborating with a friend who's my teacher and a co-translator, but then also developing relationships and uh, with um, literary agents, for example, Daniel Tompkins in the US and um, translators in Ukraine, for example, Hannah Lely, um, because I mean, it seems like course such an important time not only to, to support and platform Ukrainian authors but um, it, on a personal level it's, it's a really important counterpart to the work that I do um, uh, translating Russian authors who individually of course are no less worthy of being translated but Ukrainian as sorry Russian as a language as a colonial language as a, as a um, uh, sort of form of soft power has enjoyed a lot of privilege for a long time and it's <laughs> really important for me to, to balance that out and, and help support Ukrainian authors at this time um, and I hope going forward <laughs> I hope this interest doesn't, doesn't stop now um, so yeah it's all different for different languages and then sorry I will stop in a minute but one thing I do through World Kid Lit is also try to um, connect publishers with translators for other some might say smaller languages, not necessarily small, but less well represented. And uh, for example, Maltese, which is a language very close to Arabic, I've been trying to um, uh, help get some Ukrainian, uh, sorry, Maltese books um, uh, to the attention of English publishers for a while. That's slow progress, <laughs> um, but there's something um, wonderful in the pipeline. Um, yeah, that's enough for now. <laughs> um, so this is my sort of interest. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you do translate from so, like, so many languages that <laughs> there are many challenges. Um, very greedy. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, and um, actually uh, mentioning that you need to work that uh, for Arabic, for example, you also take the role of a literary agent. That's something that uh, was going to be one of my next questions. Uh, but before we jump to that, uh, Lawrence, I think we haven't heard from you regarding unique challenges in your environment. Um, would you perhaps um, share your experience? Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe something that we can talk about, and this is something that Ruth and I share that's different, I think, for Simona, that um, Spain, Spain as a country translates from lots of different languages. English doesn't translate very much in general. So there's a lot of work that, I mean, I also, like Ruth, wind up acting as a champion or an agent for projects or, you know, I, I think of myself, um, you know, as a Jewish mother, a matchmaker, you know, and I, I just love um, finding, matching the right project to the right editors, even if they're not mine. You know, I mean, you know, um, since I know that Ruth, for instance, is, is doing Ukrainian and one of the things I do because I go to the book fairs and I've, you know, I have lots of publishing friends and, you know, writing friends. And so sometimes um, I will take books and, you know, show them off and just, um, for instance, these are some Ukrainian titles published by Old Lion, Starry Lev, um, written by friends, you know, Katerina is a, a, a dear friend of mine and um, the publishing house is a friend of mine. And so um, I will take these, uh, you know, on my iPad or physically um, 
you know, at the, the most recent Bologna Book Fair, there was an uh, exhibit of Ukrainian children's books in translation into lots of different languages. I brought my copies there and then Ruth brought my copies back to the UK to try and do more outreach in the UK and in the English language. So there's a lot of that that happens. But I mean, just, you know, as a translator into English, um, there are some publishers that already publish translations, but I don't limit myself to only pitching to those publishers. So very often the right project may be to a publisher um, where thematically it is a perfect match, but the publisher hasn't done a translation before. And so I wind up having to educate a lot of times um, both the publisher who's buying the book and very often the publisher who's selling the book to, you know, how, do, how does the right sale happen? And especially, you know, with a children's book, you have, um, the rights, you have a disc fee. This is something that um, not all publishers know, not all publishers who are buying a book understand that or selling it, you know, they don't know what to charge, how much to charge, um, how to give you the translators are not given a royalty, um, you know, so being treated fairly is something that is very difficult. Um, the, the question of recognition is something that is a big problem where very often translators are not mentioned, uh, not only on the cover, sometimes not even inside. <laughs> um, I've, I've translated in Uh, uh, sorry, Lawrence, I think we lost you for a bit again. Um, so you were, I think the last one, the, the last bit that I heard was um, translators not being mentioned on the cover. Was that the same for you, uh, Ruth, Simona? Okay. Oh, well, I guess we'll have to wait for a bit. Oh, okay. Um, and let's wait for Lawrence to join us again. Does anyone want to uh, add anything to what Lawrence was saying in the meantime? We can move on to Simona. It would be interesting to hear what your experience is of uh, the way that translators are recognized or, or credited in those languages. Uh, um, okay. Okay. Uh, well, uh, something, uh, Ruth, you mentioned your feeling you have when you uh, deal with Arabic literature that there are so many people who do not know a lot about it, you know, that this is a problem. Well, imagine what kind of problem is that for somebody who translates for us, such a small literature like Slovenia is, uh, where we are usually not uh, people I talk to are not usually uh, able to situate us on the map. Maybe today, uh, be today is better because Slovenia had quite a nice development after the, uh, the, 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 the 19th, you know, after the fall of Yugoslavia. But before I just uh, came to Barcelona just a few years before, and then it was like Slovakia and Slovenia, they even laughed. Uh, how, how funny it is to not be able to understand what, which is which. Um, so my, uh, my main uh, problem and also goal is to be able to put Slovenia, Slovenian literature on the map. That's why I'm very grateful to Lawrence who does not hear me, but uh, about to mention this uh, anthology uh, that I made many years ago uh, into Spanish. So I just, I, I found the publisher, which were, they were making the whole series of anthologies for smaller languages or less known languages. So that was very good opportunity to put together those authors I like to translate in the future and explain uh, what our literature is in this uh, through the literary text, not just explaining as a scholar. Uh, and that was really nice project. And I always try actually when I translate a book uh, that they let me have a, an introduction or an epilogue or something, or at least some notes at the end or glossaries or things like that to be, because I'm very aware that it's not just translating because they don't know, even it's not such a distance but they don't actually know what our um, 
volcanic or uh, alpine world is, no? because we are on the crossroads. Uh, so it's many things that you have somehow to put inside the book and in the covers of the book. Usually I have uh, very good experiences with publishers, so they are keen, they, they like that you explain them that. But there are uh, several cases where I was actually not able to get uh, a single note, even on, on the footnote. Uh, and this is sometimes very frustrating because I am very aware people will, will not be able to understand the book without this minimum comment at the end or so called. So this is also something I try. I find that like a challenge. Uh, this is in Spain when translating into Slovenia, we are very, uh, we are a culture uh, nation. Uh, it means, you know, culture is everything for us. We don't have uh, armies and uh, sportsmen, yes, but culture is still everything. So you can actually convince Slovenian editors into anything uh, if you are uh, prepared for that. So they will be translating at the long term any authors from anywhere. They will let you to explain, to make prologues and epilogues and meetings and whatsoever. Money is not always there, but this interest for uh, everything that is different from our small country uh, is, is there. So this is for me also quite a different work, uh, trying to convince somebody in Slo Slovenia to publish or to be read the books, mm -hmm. or trying to get this attention in Spain where they are always uh, somehow uh, precautious and say, do you mean this will be interesting or do you, should we know that? So uh, there's more, much more work, previous work. So you, I, I have books which, for which I worked 10 years to be able to publish. So, yeah, and I still remember <laughs> when I first started to talk about the title and then that you have it printed, it can easily take uh, a decade. So it's not an easy job, that's true. Right. <laughs> um, does anyone want to add anything to that? Um, I think, Lawrence, we lost you. Um, yeah, when... we had a storm and my internet went out. So I'm, I'm back now on my data. So um, okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I don't no, know when I got cut off, but um, I mean, just what Simona was saying about books taking a very long time sometimes. Um, I definitely have that experience. I, uh, one of the books that's coming out um, this autumn is a um, book. Um, um, this is called The Book of Denial. And um, it's a very difficult book. I just, I fell in love with um, Mexico 2014. So I translated a sample of this and have been pitching it since 2014, now coming out. So again, it was almost 10 years before finding the publisher. This is a very difficult book because it's um, it's not quite a children's book, it's not quite an adult book, it's a very graphically heavy, but it's not a graphic novel. So, you know, finding a publisher that was the right publisher for this, um, and, uh, in the end it's, it's coming out from a, a new imprint from uh, the American publisher that mostly has done children's books up until uh, Enchanted Lion, and they've just done a new imprint called Unruly, um, illustrated books for adults or for all ages. And so, uh, but this was a case where I've known the editor for years. I've never had projects that were quite right for her, but to me, so much about pitching is the matchmaking that it's learning editors. And so since I'm in touch with so many editors about my own books, the book translate, the books by friends. Um, so a lot of, I don't recommend other you know, just, you know, by, by publishers or authors that I'm friends with. You know, so when I had this book, the way announcement to publishers, I said to the editor, I said, I have a for you finally. And literally she bought the book in three hours. It's a fact I have ever sold the book, but it was also, um, you know, we first met, I guess, in 2007. So it was almost uh, 15 years of knowing each other and knowing the tastes in order to when I finally had the right project, I was able to say, this is the book for you kind of thing. So um, I think what I got cut off or I didn't have a chance to say was also that as a, that I'm also a literary mediator, 
because if I'm translating into English, very often writers who taught themselves speak English at all. And so one of the ways that or when I'm actively involved is some of these writers in English, um, sometimes literally if they come festival or sometimes because, you know, anytime one wanted to interview for one, one example, this is um, a novel from Equatorial Guinea. This one from Equatorial Guinea to be published in English translation. Um, this is the, uh, the feminist edition, and this is the, the edition published in Africa by, um, in South Africa by Mojaji Books, where we felt it was morally important that there was an English edition published in Africa um, so that, you know, by the time a book from the West gets to Africa, at least so it's, it's not affordable. So, you know, one of the things when I know the original from uh, the book, and so I was the ambassador and the agent for the book. And so when we sold it to the feminist press, they have world rights in English except for Africa. So, um, but because she doesn't speak English, so anytime anyone wants to interview um, questions, I translate them into Spanish. She answers, I have to translate the answers back into, into English. So, I mean, there's a lot of this extra work, you know, but I'm very actively involved, you know, throughout the life of the book. So, and, and this is, I think, I, I don't know if I had gotten cut off. One of the things I was, I was mentioning is that um, we have a lot of problems of recognition for translation into English that, you know, our names are very often aren't on, but we also, we, we're, we're not often given royalties. Very often there's this assumption that we're treated like um, trade as it were, you know, that we do this service, you know, like the layout and then that's over. Whereas we are, you know, it is all of our words in the target language, you know, so everything about the book, <laughs> except for the original book, is ours, you know, and so it, it, it's the difference of, um, you know, if a musician does their version of a song, it's their version of the song and their, they get royalties on their version, even though they also pay royalties to the original person. But in English, there's, there's not that sense usually that we should be participants um, and to be participants throughout the process of a book. You know, if a book uh, has sub licenses or if it sells, you know, if there's a movie based off of the book and then they use your translation to do the subtitles, you know, you should be participating in that. Um, a lot of times as a poet, uh, there will be things, authors that I've translated into English and someone will then use my English to translate them into another language. Um, this is actually something where uh, the, the Slovene poet that I published in, in the collection that I mentioned from the poetry publisher, Jana Putuli Strzedek, uh, my apologies for the pronunciation. I was able to read her work um, because in Argentina, there was a collection of her poems published in Gog y Magog. And so I was able to read her work in Spanish, decide to publish her, her in English. Um, and curiously, there's a publisher here in Spain who read this book in English and was able to commission a translation of her next book to be published in Spain in translated in Spanish directly, but the editor, because the editor doesn't read Slovene, you know, so it was an interesting way that um, through the translations, um, it opens a lot of doors. And especially I think for, um, for certain uh, publishers or, or pub translations from certain languages. I mean, I know for instance, the first uh, title we published was from the Estonian and then from the English this was translated into Arabic and it was the very first Estonian book ever translated into Arabic. So, you know, I'm not directly involved, but I have this sort of avuncular pride that, you know, by, by making cultural space for these voices, um, that has helped them to, to go on and, and find other publishing opportunities and to reach other readers, um, either directly commissioned or through other, um, so. This is also something I don't know if I'm jumping in too much, but since I, I, I dropped off, I don't know where, where we are right now. <laughs> but I did want to mention um, the relationship between translators who've translated the same authors. So this is a special kind of thing and it's not anything formal, but um, I know, for instance, my Barbara um, Pregnell, who's my translator into uh, Slovenian, she has also translated some authors that I've translated. Um, and so very often we are, gossiping and saying, you know, or, or I'll, I'll, I'll be working on a book and I'll send her the manuscript and be like, you know, oh, you should check this out because you might like it also. And the same with um, Kazumi Umi in, in Japan. She's translated two of my books into Japanese, but she and I have also translated some of the same authors. And so again, we'll also be, um, you know, it, we, we share information, we share projects. Um, uh, Anne Cohen Bucher is a, a translator from Spanish and English into French who's in Belgium. 
And um, we first met because um, we had both translated a Spanish author, Yameros Campos. And, um, but then she has wound up translating, she was asked to translate a book of mine by a, a, a publisher without knowing that we know each other as colleagues as, you know, and so um, that's just an extra uh, literary mediator or, or translation to translator relationship that um, I think can be special. I think Simone, I don't know if you had translated into Catalan Brane, was that right? When we first met and so, um, I had published in English a poet that Simona has translated into uh, Catalan, and that was how we first met years ago when that book had been published. Um, and I came to to Barcelona for a, a visit, and I, you know, so we we met up in person as a way of um, sharing information, I guess, and good colleagueship. <laughs> Yes, uh, Lawrence, you're right. That was the, uh, when we met in Tokten, it, it seemed that we would be uh, uh, old friends for, uh, for, from our youth, you know, because this is something that, which also happens, I believe, to everybody who is in this, uh, uh, working with so many languages that we are, we are special in our environment. And that is, are your questions, Katerina? Uh, probably, but we are strange, strange people for the people we live with. But among ourselves, uh, we are quite normal. Which are, <laughs> so that this kind of, ah, I translated this, I read that in Arabic. Ah, I can uh, translate this into Slovenian. It's <laughs> usual, it's not for us. It's probably the way we understand each other. Very good. Uh, and I remember I once organized here in Catalonia uh, a really a, a workshop with writer with all the translators from Jesus Moncada, which I don't know if you know him. Uh, and uh, he's a writer who described a beautiful novel about how his uh, village or town where he lived was uh, sinked under the water because they, they built a dam. Uh, in the Francoist time and so on. And we went there, this is really in the middle of nowhere in the, in the central, well, inside uh, of the peninsula. And the people from all over came from, I don't know, all Europe and other also out South Europe. And we all spent several days there together speaking. And he was not there, he was already there. And then we one stop on the gas station in the, uh, in the going back, driving back to Barcelona, I thought, we are really strange people. They were a tall guy from Holland and a very small guy from Israel and so on, you know. And I thought, with the translator, really, really strange. And I, this, this picture of, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 people who all meet together only because uh, 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 they translated the same novel. They felt in love with the same novel. I always think that this is something very special net that we build through this kind of work. It's not, not just work, it's not just money, it's not just building uh, bridges for cultures, but also for us as a person. So I, I believe that it makes us somehow richer. I would say though, I mean, sorry to jump in again, Ruth, but I would say that it's, you know, it, it would be much more uncommon this multilingual, um, for me as an American than it is here in Europe. I mean, to me, this is a very European, a normal European, um, you know, even just in Barcelona, you have the multilingual, you know, Spain is a very multilingual place, but um, I think that Europe and the idea of this multilingual, multicultural Europe is something that is so integral in a very different way than um, the US where I'm from or the UK where Ruth is, where I think the monolingualism and the xenophobia is much, much, much stronger. Um, so I would also say that I think that as a, um, I mean, since both Simone and I write as well as translating, and I think that that is also um, something, you know, it, it's different in Ruth's case. Ruth, I don't know that she would have time to write anything because she's translating from so many different languages <laughs> all the time. But um, I know that certainly as a poet for me, the translation work I do is definitely part of my poetics, um, if that makes sense. And so, and I think that it's um, it's very enriching for my own writing, a lot of the translating that I'm doing. And that very often there are, um, or I've been privileged to take place in Slovenia, actually, a number of workshops of um, 
authors translating one another, uh, which has been a rewarding thing. One thing I was going to show, um, this is a novel written in Latvian by one of the participants in a children's workshop I took place in. I think we were in Dane or Pizan, Piran, I, I forget where we were uh, in 2012. And all of the writers who took part, we are different characters in this novel. Um, so for instance, this is the Suns, the, the dog, the perro, who's named Lawrence, like me. And so um, <laughs> all of us are, are characters. Uh, this is the English translation by um, Janet, uh, uh, that was published by uh, the Emma Press in the UK. But as a result of that though, um, and this was something that before I got cut off, Ruth had mentioned Maltese. And so one of the participants was a Maltese author uh, who also is a translator, uh, Claire Isaac Pardi. And so these are two books that I translated into Spanish, um, written by Claire in Maltese. I didn't translate from the Maltese. I worked from the English. Um, but at the same time, there were a lot of times that the English as a bridge, um, especially working between inflected languages, uh, is very deficient. You know, I mean, if I'm, I need to know, if it just says the teacher translating into Spanish, I need to know, is it a male teacher, a female teacher, a no, non-binary teacher, various things like that. And um, even though I don't speak uh, Maltese, I didn't just translate the English, I went back to the Maltese. So very often there were things like, so this book is about um, all these cats and um, all of the cat names, for instance, in Maltese, they rhymed. And in English, the translator had done a literal translation of the different names. And I said, can I make up different names that rhyme in Spanish? You know, so one is called Puma and Espuma. Um, so, you know, I, I uh, o cobrito and chorizo. So I made up different names. Um, and very often since Claire um, speaks Italian and translates from Italian as well, there were times when the syntax that between uh, Maltese and English had been very different. And I said, well, how would you say this in Italian? And that solution was perfect for my Spanish. Um, so, you know, working together directly with the author, even though I don't speak Maltese, um, you know, but that was something that definitely came out of these European multicultural workshops, you know, multilingual workshops where we worked with one another and then, um, you know, and talked a, lo a lot about um, the solutions and the problems that came up. I mean, I remember in, in a, you know, so I, I, my father jokes that I write books for children and books you don't want your children to find. So there was a, um, a poetry workshop um, for gay poets working from different languages that I also took part in um, in Slovenia. And I was, there was one poem of mine that could not be translated because it, it I th I'm trying to think what the original line was, but I think it's the poem has an erection would be the translation. And in Slovenian, all of the terms, poem, word, text were all female. And so it was an, a physical obstacle that they couldn't get an erection. So, I mean, this was something that, um, and that was fascinating. I mean, to me though, the, the biggest, um, eye opener was um, the dual that Slovenian has that doesn't in, exist in either English or Spanish, which are the two languages that I create in and I translate between primarily. But I've <laughs> ever since I learned that, I've been aware that um, am I talking about an intimate we, a you and I we, or a general we? And so, you know, as a result of you know taking part in these uh, translation workshops, even though I don't translate directly with Slovenian, being translated into Slovenian and talking with these translators changed how I think forever, you know, and, and that learning has, has made my, you know, has enriched, even though it doesn't exist in either Spanish or English, it's enriched my literature and my literary thinking and how I treat literature um, as a result of translation, so. That's lovely, that point about that we, and realizing that through reading or through translating or learning another language, the way that there are small ways that we see the world differently. Um, I told you already that I'm quite obsessed with learning languages and quite greedy or voracious <laughs> about having another one. And for some of last year, I started to teach myself Indonesian, just thought it seemed fun. And the one thing I remember is that there are two words for we, there's one that includes me, oh, sorry, one, oh, what is it about? Yeah, different words for, one that includes the, the speaker who you're talking to, so we with you or we without you. And that's such an important, nuance that we just don't express in that way in English. Um, and we have similar challenges with Russian. With Russian, sometimes it's um, it, it's the lack of the, and, and Slavic language is generally the lack of the articles. So it's the thing, a thing, 
are we going to mention this thing again? Does it matter? And all the time thinking, it, <laughs> how much more information do we need to give? Um, how much more information do I need from the author? And these are things that I think that, you know, as literary mediators, these are things that come up. And so, um, I mean, just as another example, I'm friends with uh, the Icelandic author illustrator, Auslaug Jonsdottir. And um, this is a book of hers that I thought was just delightful. Um, the original book is called Eggville Fisk, um, which in English I can say it's I Want Fish. Um, I worked with Auslaug to translate the book. Um, I had studied Old Norse when I was in university and Icelandic because it's isolated, had no linguistic contamination. So basically my Old Norse dictionaries were still valid. And, um, but uh, you know, she had done the layout for me with the Spanish translation I prepared. Um, you can see it's, I want fish keeps getting bigger and bigger as, as the child keeps wanting um, the fish. I had to change the title though, because it didn't work. Um, in Spanish. Spanish uses two different words, pez for fish that's alive and pescado for fish that's, um, and that actually, you know, the book is all about um, a child who doesn't yet have vocabulary and the parents thinking they know what the kid wants and the kid keeps saying, I want pez, but she really wants pescado. So um, in Spanish, it actually works better, but we had to, you know, I changed the title to Mar sabe lo que quiere, Mar knows what she wants. Um, Galician though, this is the Galician edition. So Galician doesn't distinguish between the pez and pescado. And so I had used the Spanish uh, layout that Auslog had prepared and you know showed it around and we couldn't find a publisher in Spanish, but a publisher in Galician wanted it. So I then translated the book into Galician. Um, I, I, had, I don't generally translate other authors into Galician, but I had self-translated um, four of my own children's books into Galician. So I do have experience doing it. Um, it's really laborious, um, but Galician as it's written is very mathematical and it depends on which government is in power. Sometimes it, it goes closer to Portuguese or closer to Spanish. Um, they change the, the actual rules of the language uh, based on politics, not on how people actually speak. And so uh, it was an interesting thing where uh, one time one of the, the copy editors was like, this is wrong. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, I have an old dictionary. And she's actually, it, it, it's correct. I went back and checked and it's gone back to that. And so, um, you know, these are, but, you know, knowing how to resolve things like with the title is something that as translators, even before we're doing the project or sometimes after we're asked to do a project, I mean, just to give another example, this was a Canadian book that I translated, uh, Little You, um, two indigenous creators, uh, Richard Van Camp and uh, Julie Flett. Um, in English, it never genders the you who's being addressed. So it shows different indigenous families and different uh, combinations of parents and uh, or caretakers and children, but the you is never addressed. And in Spanish, um, all diminutives are gendered. And so that was a huge uh, obstacle. So in the end, I wound up, you know, it's also, it's a book that's in rhyme without gender. And so to me, it's important to recreate the reading experience. So I, I did a very simple translation using the masculine as the neutral um, and just translating it as it was without rhyming. And then I did a rhyming version that kept it gender neutral, um, even though I took a lot more liberties and that's the one that, that, that was published. So in that one, it was called uh, Tu Eres Tu, You Are You, as a way of getting around the, um, you know, pequeñito, pequeñita, um, or using direct non-binary language, which is hard for kids that age that they're just learning language. So, and Spanish doesn't have a good solution for gender neutral language. So, um, you know, a lot of times there are cultural things that I flag um, either when presenting a project or while working on a project, I'll flag stuff for my editors and be like, we might want to talk about this. <laughs> um, one thing that, uh, just to mention from this book, um, the author in Spanish uses curandero. And I was like, okay, I am a white male American translating a black African woman. I cannot use the word witch doctor. That's just a colonialist term. Um, and so I you know, had long conversations with my editor and we decided to leave it as curandero in the original rather than use this loaded um, colonialist language, so. These are, you know, maybe more specific details about books, but you know, they're the stuff that I love. You know, they're they're things that come up that I just love um, finding solutions to, if that makes sense. And it's sort of, you know, when you can uh, resolve something like that, 
and bring it to readers and recreate the reading experience for them, that's the best thing, I think. <laughs> So we have another question to Simona. I'm really interested to hear how different your work experience is um, working from one language or to the other. So working from Slovenian into Spanish or Catalan, is, is you work in a similar way, like your relationships with authors, the way you work as an agent for them, is that different for when you work into Slovenian? Well, it was, but now I changed the country. You know, but it's for me the, in these 30 years, a, a very interesting experience is actually how I left home. I, I suppose you both will understand that, no? Uh, uh, Lauren, especially because you write also in, in Spanish. So you, you, you feel how your fidelities mm -hmm. change, no? From the, uh, the beginning, it was, of course, they have to know who we are. It, it meant Slovenians coming to Spain. And now somehow it's uh, really important for me also that everything I know, uh, all the knowledge I, uh, I, I have now about what is Barcelona uh, or, or Catalonia is also known abroad different. No? So this is, this is for me quite an experience actually of uh, seeing how you you change also not not only your work changes but the way you see yourself uh, is is evolutioning and changing all the time so uh, and also with language i also remember that you said you struggle to preserve your arabic on the level this is for me also not slovenia of course i speak slovenian with my children and that's it and they are all all now grown up and they don't live with me anymore so uh, who should i speak slovenian to you know and uh, all the uh, i don't know it there are new and new words are produced today because there are so many changes so you i, I still remember when i first paid with a contact class a card in the supermarket in Ljubljana, they, they, they said, Jebrestichna, and they said, what is this, my God? And they just translated contactless in a very tremendous Slovenian, because we do produce this kind of uh, new words. And they said, of course, it, it's maybe just half a year that I was not there, but I lost the, the, the name for, for contactless uh, uh, credit card. So these kind of things are, are very difficult to to stay in, no? To be also to stay in with uh, with the authors, with what is now important. And here's also another experience. I don't know if you share uh, the change of generation. I never thought that that will trap me, that I will feel that because I always thought I am a young person. I will stay young all my life, and then suddenly you look behind and say, "Oh, they 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 behave like you are a professor, and they just came, no, and something like that," or or vice versa, that you have a very clever young people, and they think you are an old woman, and what? Why should you actually have any opinion about us? You don't understand us, and it happens here. It's also a struggle, and it's not only a struggle to be uh, from one country to another, but also in your own culture, no? in the both for me in Slovenia and in Catalan, to stay aware of what is happening behind me, not, in, not just in front of me, but also to be able to understand people who write now, and they are very good writers. They, the new generations, I would say, this is uh, at least in both these small cultures I see is that there is a new interest in literature, maybe because life is uh, tougher than it was when you were young. Uh, there are mo much more conflict, much more insecurities in life. So the, uh, the literature that is now produced is very interesting. And also we have in Europe now this generation, Erasmus generation, not people like yourself, Katarina, that don't know what is crossing the border because you never show a passport anymore. And we'll, but I, I, I was, uh, I lived with the idea of Iron Curtain still, no? And going to America was like going to the Mars, very far away. And now not anymore. So this is also for this international exchange is very different speaking with people who have 20 years today 
than those who have 40 or 50 only, yeah? because ch uh, world changed. And this is also uh, a challenge, I believe, that we, we face somehow, not to, to be able to keep putting these things together, no? Different things. And for translator, maybe we are more aware about that, that not everything is the same, no? Because people who do not transmit they just believe that the, their, their point of view is the one that exists and there is no others. No? But we probably, because we deal with that all the day long, you have the sensibility of saying, oh, I don't understand that, or I was wrong because the other is, is having another way of looking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talking about that, I mean, I think it's important for us as translators to also know what books we're not the right translators for. You know, I mean, that's something that, you know, so often our lives are about this precarity that we need work and there isn't enough work. Um, and that's, you know, no matter what language is and, you know, the work isn't paid enough. And so it's very hard to turn down work and especially very hard to turn down paying work. I mean, there's, um, I was asked to translate, um, personally, I don't do well with um, sports books. So I, I know nothing about soccer. And um, every time, I, the, the very few times I've had to do live interpreting, which is very different than translating, I've always stumbled that someone has made a soccer reference and I didn't know it. And luckily the audience knew right away. Um, you know, there was something, uh, Fuera del Juego, which was offside rules. You know, I didn't know what it was. The audience knew exactly. And we, you know, the person who was speaking made a joke and said, he's American. He doesn't know from soccer. So, um, <laughs> you know, but, you know, actually the book is, I think, very successful um, in, in Slovenia. It's published by Malink. It's The Futbolissimos by uh, yeah. Roberto Santiago. And I was asked to do it. And I said, look, I know friends who are professional translators and they are hooligans, <laughs> you know, one of whom had worked for FIFA. I said, they will do the book. They will do a much better job translating this book than I will. This is not the right book for me. In this case, it's not so much a generational issue like uh, Simona was talking about, although that does come up. I mean, there are things that I don't have the right connection to that I say, um, you know, there are also, there are younger translators that I will say, why don't you ask this person and this person, their, their um, affinity is stronger for this particular book and they will be a much better translator for this book than I will. Um, and, you know, that's also a way of creating, helping make sure that the new generations, not just of writers, but of translators also wind up having access to things, uh, to opportunities, you know what I mean? There's, I mentioned that I translate um, at least one writer of color every year in in any direction, um, just to make sure because those are those are writers that I've I've never been asked by a publisher to translate a writer of color. You know, these are always projects that I have to find and I have to go knocking on doors. Um, but I'm also I'm doing a private mentorship with a young uh, black translator, Leila Benitez James, and um, we're co-translating an Afropian novel, um, and it's been fascinating. Yeah, I mean. One, it's been fascinating, the stuff that I take for granted. Um, I don't have the pedagogy. I never trained as a translator. I am a multilingual writer and I wound up starting to translate because publishers started asking me to, to translate in one direction or the other. Um, and actually being translated from Spanish into English was something that gave me a lot more uh, confidence that um, my Spanish is good enough that other people are translating into English. I can also translate into Spanish that you know my Spanish was, was considered worthy in that way. Um, and you know, working with Leila has been fascinating. There's lots of stuff that um, that I wind up teaching her with the nuts and bolts of things, and the relationship works both ways. You know, and that's the intergenerational thing where um, she aims higher than I would in many ways. You know, so we won a national endowment for the Arts Translation Fellowship for the project that we're working on, and it was a thing where she said, "No, let's take this book and we'll shoot for the stars." And she did the application, and we we were granted that, you know, so there's a lot of stuff that it's not just um, my imparting from the top of the mountain knowledge, you know, that it's a collaboration. Um, I made very sure that um, we split any money 50-50, um, you know, so we had done a sample for a publisher and so everything was split 50-50. I'm not an old white guy trying to get a cheap assistant, um, especially in this case with a younger black woman as my co-translator. We are 50-50 co-translators. Um, even though I have translated over 130 books and she has not yet published a book translation. So, you know what I mean? It's, it's 
but it's not unequal in 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 that sense. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there there are things that we each bring to the the relationship. Um, I did I, just the other thing with the change of uh, generation. I was going to mention. Um, so as an author, my first short story collection is being uh, translated again into Spanish in Argentina. Um, and it's coming out this fall. It's the 25th anniversary that the book was published and the translator is only 22. So he's younger than the book. For him, the book is historical fiction. So that was just a weird, <laughs> a weird thing for me as an author because I also feel like Simona that it's like, I still feel like I'm just starting out and because I am the one who has to bang on publishers doors all the time to you know get them to take on projects as a translator or writer and things. So, um, but I did also want to ask Simona um, what your experience is writing or self-translating that is do you ever self-translate your own writing because i know you write about both slovenia in catalan and uh catalonia in slovenian but i don't know then if those things i know that my experience as a writer i write differently about spain in english and in spanish and so um and i tend except if i'm doing bilingual books with parallel text i tend not to try and self-translate at this point um so, which is an interesting, um, I don't know, actually Ruth uh, was going to, I, I wrote one poem in German during the lockdown, the COVID lockdown with my, you know, Wörter book. And, um, you know, it's something that doesn't exist in anything except for that German edition. And so, and I was like, but I shouldn't self-translate it. This is my own, my first, you know, creation in German, um, you know, and Ruth was, when she had time, she was like, I'll translate it. And so it was just a, um, oh, I don't know, say, I'll how, <laughs> We'll have to do it together as a collaboration. <laughs> um, I don't know, Simona, how you write about both Slovenia and Catalonia, if there's a difference and if you do self-translate. Yeah, I have a very weird experience about self-translating. I published my first uh, literary book in 2019, and it was about my, well, let's say, about my travels. You know, I was now for six years uh, the chair of the um, Translation Linguistic Rights Committee of uh, in Pen International. So everything you said about uh, having this uh, consciousness of helping people who are not having the same opportunity for cultural exchange, that was my daily life. Really, I, I traveled quite a lot uh, also. And then some, and one point I said, I have to put all that on paper because I don't know anymore who I am. So it's start, time to start. So would be prepared. There will, you, it will come a day <laughs> or another that you will feel I have to write about myself. And I, I wrote that and that is so, and a nice book of hundred very short stories. They happen everywhere in the world, and I am like a protagonist because I needed to put uh, myself there because everything else is not connected. So it was like, oh, let's do that. And had a quite nice reception in here in Catalonia. And then, of course, I agreed uh, very early also to have a Slovenian translation of that, and that I would translate myself. And in the meantime, pandemia happened. COVID happened. So I had to translate myself, all that. So, you know, I am uh, catching another plane and never get, go home and things like that, said the book. And I was translating that in the March 2020. Mm -hmm. So first uh, uh, lockout, uh, lockdown. And it was, it was terrible uh, to see myself uh, not being anymore what I was. It was a historical Simona just in <laughs> a few weeks, really. And also the book speaks another thing about a world that we lost. That is just external, but in, internally for myself translating, I had, I, I really was uh, happy to have this train, all this training of translator, because I, I obliged myself not to change anything. Mm. You know, because it would be so easy to change it. And it, it is actually a book about translation, but this about, it's not about my travel, about myself, but it's actually about how you explain the same anecdote to other people. So it's, for example, when I speak uh, in Barcelona about Ramblas, of course, it's very difficult to explain that to somebody from Barcelona and not be too obvious. So yeah, I had to make 
story about that. And then when you uh, explain about Martin Karpan in Catalan, uh, nobody knows who it is. So the story must be told, but in the way that then I can translate it into Slovenian and it's not too obvious for those for who Martin Karpan is the national hero. Or I, there were some, some stories that were different in, in Slovenian really, the, the same words, but the way to read about, to, to, to tell about that, and that was a very nice experience. Not a comfortable one, because I also speak a little bit about my childhood and some uh, difficult, dif uh, difficult family stories. And of course, you know, the writers, they always, is much easier to explain that to the strangers in other another language, but when you have to translate that into your language and you know your mom or your dad will read it, uh, it's not so nice. No, it's like uh, let me see. My 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 mother said I am reading your book. Ah, and mm -hmm. I will tell you when it's finished. So that is more or less why I got for her. No, it's not good, not bad, nothing. Because of course there are stories who you can understand in another way in 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 mm -hmm. original in Catalan originals maybe just. Uh, anecdote or something not but in the other side for somebody else can be really very uh strong what you explained there yeah this reminds me though i mean one of the at the workshop that i was in 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 um there was a gay poet from switzerland and he writes um he translates between French and German, but he only writes in French because German is his mother's tongue. And so, so that his mother cannot read what he's writing, he writes in the other language. And so even though he speaks both and translates um, between them, it was just the, you know, the, 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 the mother tongue, the literal mother tongue, this is the tongue that his mother speaks. Um, it, it was difficult for him to write in that because she could read it then. And it, you know, even if she could read the German, it's different than if she reads it in French. So. <laughs> That's very interesting. Um, and thank you so much for sharing these anecdotes and, um, and uh, funny stories about stories. Um, and I'm afraid we'll have to wrap it up pretty soon. So um, let's, uh, let's do one um, last uh, question. So um, you've, you've mentioned a lot of highlights of your work, I especially like how you uh, all uh, kind of stress the importance of having like a good network um, and connections that you make as literary translators also um, among other um, literary mediator, sorry. So um, is there anything else that you would like to uh, point out as a highlight of your work? Um, Ruth, would you like to start? Um, I don't know, maybe as a highlight or something, but I mean, you know, and especially Simona had mentioned um, International Pen, and I think one thing I don't think we've talked about are uh, associations of literary translators and the importance of, um, of that for um, helping and supporting one another um, is something that I think is very vital, um, you know, and it's sort of the associationism, the, you know, for me, it's a way of both receiving and sharing information with colleagues um, and uh, sharing opportunities, um, you know, Ruth, Ruth and I do this also with the, uh, the World Kidlet platform, you know, I mean, there, there's lots of ways of being a, a good literary citizen um, that, uh, that helps make the publishing world a little closer to how we would like it to be rather than how it is now. So, I mean, um, publishing is a business and it's important to recognize that it's a business and, um, you know, uh, but it's important also to, um, to keep the focus on stories and the transmission of stories rather than just on the commerce. And I think that um, literary mediators and translators um, play a vital role in that, um, but that there's still so much work that needs to be done to, to affect change in the industry um from the top down uh, mm -hmm. i mean especially the people who are the decision makers um very often are a very small minority deciding on what is worth publishing and whose stories are not worth publishing and that then changes so much and also you know very often the critics um you know the few the few critics uh the few the few book reviews that actually get published in in mainstream media these days tend to be um 
perpetuating their own identities and not as open to other things, which is very different than uh, certain new technologies. I mean, you know, book talk or, or TikTok, there's, there's a subdivision within TikTok called book talk, which is, you know, one of these generational things. I'm 50, I'm not a TikTok user. But I love the fact that there are readers who are connecting with other readers directly using these new medias and that they're not relying only on um, the newspapers to get their criticism, you know, and that there are other ways that people find books and connect about books. Um, and that I think is amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, as someone who also has seen some TikToks. <laughs> um. Just as a, um, a, a passing um, comment about sort of something I'm proud of, I would just carry on from what Norris has said. That, um, I think what I'm most proud of in terms of mediating in recent years is the work that we've been doing at World Kidnet um, to, to grow the community of, um, and to, you know, to use social media as a, as a platform to raise awareness of what books are translated because so many books for children and, and teenagers, young adults, um, the publishers make no effort to, to flag or up the fact that it's a translated book. And to me, that's a real missed opportunity because um, I think there's a growing movement of readers who are interested in finding out the, about the world through reading, who want to see beyond the news um, what's happening in a country or about the country's culture, maybe somewhere that they've traveled to, somewhere that they have family from. And I think literature is such a great vehicle for opening up those connections and, and inspiring young people. So um, I'm really proud of the community that we've got at World Kidnet, the way that we use this hashtag, world, hashtag World Kidnet, or hashtag, hashtag World Kidnet Month in September, to bring together people who are, who are selling books, promoting them, um, and also people who are, who are looking for books from, from beyond their own country, from beyond Europe, books from Africa, books from Asia, um, from Latin America. Um, and um, yeah, I just feel like every day by day, our community is just becoming more inclusive and more joined up. Um, and, and that means not only are more diverse books being published, I hope, but also that they're getting seen by and read by an, a greater number of um, young people. Eventually. Yeah, it's lovely. Um, Simona? I, uh, I would add, agree with everything you said. I would add also, which I try to do is to uh, change the academia, not only uh, to bring people who think the way and are open-minded, but also that, uh, as, as Lawrence uh, mentioned, these decision makers are very few always. And one of the very dec decisive decision make makers are actually the academia because they decide what will stay, what is canon, what is what should be. Uh, also, they have a lot of influence to, for, for the public money, who is a good writer, who is representing us and so on. And in all these circles, uh, uh, the, the way we think this openness and this uh, interest for the difference must come, must, must, must have an entrance. And so this is also, I believe, something we, we should work ma very, very much to it. If you have influence on that, uh, try to change really the structure of the way that we deal with literature, because we can't have uh, the, uh, the looks that were characteristic for the 19th century and see the literature like something very national and closed in one state or country. Everything is open now. So we have other kinds of, um, of interest and problems to solve. So mm -hmm. this is important that also this evolution of writing about literature uh, or starting it changes. In, and not only about the actual literature now, contemporary, but also old classics. We have to read them and see them in the other way. So this touch with the difference, yeah, this dual that Lawrence changed your life as a poet in Slovenia. So these kinds of things must come to, to also to these other circles who are not so penetrable for, for change. Yeah. yeah. It's very difficult. I mean, it's we are all literary mediators um, doing what we can as individuals. And, you know, I think that it's we have had a lot of impact as individuals, but we need to 
overhaul the systems, which is what Simone is trying to do in academia. And that is something that's much more difficult. So um, I know there's on a pan-European level, there's a project that Slovenia is one of the partners together with um, the Flemish uh, Litter Foundation called Every Story Matters, which is a platform that is trying to uh, create more uh, diversity and inclusion uh, across European publishing with a charter of how publishers can be more inclusive, not just of who they're publishing, but also who the decision makers are, and to make sure that they are um, including a, a variety of voices. I mean, there's so many um, privilege comes into play in so many different ways of who can afford to be a writer or an editor. Um, and then that affects whose stories wind up getting told or who's telling the stories. Um, and so, you know, there, there's much more need for people to be able to tell their own stories and for uh, decision makers who say, no, this story is worth telling uh, because I think that we normalize absences. And so, I mean, certainly within children's books, um, I, I've seen so often, I mean, uh, signing at San Jordi, which is this uh, April 23rd in, in Barcelona on the Ramblas that Simona mentioned, uh, everyone gives a book in a rose on this day. It's uh, the celebration uh, in Catalonia. And, you know, it's an amazing thing. As an author, it's my favorite holiday ever. Um, but, you know, you're, you're there and all of the kids come up and they want a signed book. And um, I've often seen parents um, choosing kids or pushing them away that if there's a boy and he picks up a book about a girl and a dragon and the parents are like no don't you want this book with the boy and he's like no I want the dragon you know um, girls are expected to read books about boys but boys are not expected to read girls about books because of how the power dynamics work in our culture and so um, and I think that decision makers do a lot of these same decisions um, you know why is it that we can write a book with LGBT families if it's about being different or overcoming homophobia, but it's much harder to publish a book that's just about, I want a new pet that happens to have two moms or two dads. You know, very often the decision makers, they will publish occasionally at the big houses, they will publish that book that's about overcoming diversity because that's how they see that it fits. And then once they've published that book, they don't need any other LGBT families, even though we have lots of other lives and do lots of other things, they see this is the one acceptable way to publish this book about overcoming, you know, triumphing over homophobia, that's acceptable. But just having fun, that's very often, that's a much harder sell mm -hmm. uh, and certainly a much harder sell to a larger publisher. So, you know, that's the change in the overall structure that needs to happen, uh, that, that needs to diversify so that we have the, the plural diverse world that we live in is fully represented in the books that we have access to from writers and translators so that we as readers have, you know, can see more of the world and can see ourselves in the world. Oh, that's such a lovely thought. <laughs> um, I suggest that we end uh, on this thought. Thank you all so much for participating today. It really has been a pleasure uh, meeting you and talking to you all. Uh, thank you for sharing your ideas and um, your views. Um, and um, as you know, this will be a part of the uh, symposium. So it will be, um, I will send you the link once, I mean, you will receive it. <laughs> uh, so again, thank you all for participation. I'll start, I'll stop recording now. Uh